Welcome back to the Vermont House Human Services Committee on uh, Thursday, February 24th. This is our last um, committee segment of the day and we are continuing our um, research and testimony on what we can do and what the landscape is out there in terms of opioid, opioid op overdose crisis response. And we have with us this afternoon, um, doc, Dr. Maruti, who is an addiction from addiction medicine psychiatry at UVM MC. Um, Dr. Maruti, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Pugh, and thank you to the committee for this opportunity to be pre present here. Uh, as you all know, uh, we are in the midst of an epidemic here in Vermont in terms of uh, the morbidity and mortality associated with uh, drug overdoses. And I'm very grateful to the committee for um, allowing me this opportunity. Um, what the drivers for this uh, are very complex, as you know. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic that has affected all walks of life and multiple layers, both of our society uh, and at a societal level, but also individually. And this has uh, had a downstream effect where people are in greater and greater isolation and people who needed services, who needed care, uh, who were just holding on, uh, are now having difficulty accessing those services, or um, in some cases, having a much greater difficulty in just living their own lives in terms of their jobs, access to finances, um, and access to their own organic supports. So these uh, things are all connected. There's a domino effect in addition to um, the increased potency of uh, synthetics such as fentanyl that are more available, along with the admixture with uh, other um, synthetic uh, creations such as crystal meth. So many things are combining and unfortunately where it leads to is uh, greater morbidity or, and mortality. And you know the fact that the committee feels that this is important is a, a, a good step towards the honoring the memory of those who have passed away and uh, honoring the loved ones of those people who will remember that absence for the rest of their lives. Um, with anything complex, the solutions themselves are complex. And if we think about uh, immediate remedies and we think about sort of midterm, long-term remedies, uh, one can really think access to treatment, access to safe spaces, is really what we need on an immediate level. Uh, in terms of sort of the midterm uh, and long-term, what we really need is to be investing in the infrastructure, uh, the entire continuum of support from education onto uh, workforce training uh, so that we can have uh, people in Vermont uh, be able to both access services that are high quality, but also people who want to get involved have the ability to have those jobs uh, so that they can stay here. Um, so uh, those are sort of uh, some opening thoughts and um, I would welcome your questions and comments and look forward to those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Marudi. Um, when you talk about, <clears throat> I will start with a question and then turn it over to other committee members. When you talk about the immediate need is access to treatment. Um, are there steps we can take that will um, improve access to treatment? You know, I think in terms of the immediate need, uh, there are a number of infrastructure aspects that are already present, um, which uh, a lot of very good people um, staff, uh, the, everything from uh, the different layers, whether it is uh, the community uh, areas such as the turning points, which are nonprofit, uh, along with the various hubs of care that are distributed throughout Vermont, along with the designated agencies, along with the uh, tertiary uh, medical centers, the EMS services. Uh, so those many of those are in place. Um, however, uh, we're, we're finding is that people are not able to access them in a timely way. 
So in an immediate sense, uh, perhaps uh, some of those uh, sort of institutions can have uh, some support in having a more proactive uh, outreach efforts so that those people could be identified. Um, I know that the mayor of Burlington has convened um, uh, task forces and uh, committees related to this. I was on one uh, earlier this week. Um, so I know that people are aware and are doing things, but I think uh, definitely going with what's available um, and having a little bit more proactive outreach uh, getting people into treatment, getting people into treatment in a timely way um, has been affected, unfortunately, by uh, COVID very directly. So there are places where um, staff are out because of COVID. Um, they are not able to take people in a timely way. So uh, those things where if we have greater workforce and greater redundancy, uh, the system can keep moving. But really in the short term, I think um, greater outreach as well as just greater awareness. Maybe there are people who are not aware of what services are available um, and th those things can hopefully help mitigate some of the uh, difficulties. Yes. Um, thank you again for being here today. I, um, we heard earlier today from um, a few different um, folks from Burlington who talked a bit about removing prior authorization for quicker, um, pro, you know, being able to have, um, make things happen a lot quicker. And I wondered what you thought about that and what the, yeah. uh, just gave us some advice on how to possibly move forward on that. Yeah, I think the more friction points we can remove, uh, the better it is, the better it is for uh, the patients, uh, the providers, and the systems. Uh, removing friction points is not equivalent to removing safeguards. And, but it's really, for example, um, if you have a, a prior auth and you have to go through that process and it is 4.44 on a Friday evening and uh, somebody's out of the office in order to be able to provide that or has that specialty training in order to do that, then that patient may languish um, without receiving their prescription. So having that ability removed, I really appreciate that sentiment. And I, I agree with that, that having less prior authorizations can be very helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Maruti, you said that the other immediate uh, concern or thing to address is, is safe spaces for folks who are using drugs. Can you expand on what that would look like as an immediate response? Yeah, you know, I think that um, people need alternatives to being uh, in spaces where there's a preponderance of drugs or the ability to access them. Um, I have, uh, you know, people who I know who work at Turning Point, patients who have really benefited from those type of spaces. These are sober spaces where a person can come non-judgmentally, can come there, have a place for relaxing, recreation, support, along with having uh, job training, counseling, uh, the ability to put a resume together. So those type of, um, I'd almost call them oases in the middle of the desert, um, can be really uh, very, very encouraging for people and create a safe and positive alternative. And uh, thank you for that one. I, I appreciate the, the need for sober spaces, especially for folks who are in recovery. Another piece that came up in earlier testimony was, was kind of on the opposite end of that and folks who are actively in addiction um, and the, the movement towards overdose prevention sites. And I would love to get your insight and thoughts on those. Well, that, as you know, it's a, it's a complex topic and it uh, creates uh, very strong feelings. Um, uh, there are places in the world and in our country um, and in other countries where um, people have accessed those and have um, been able to receive support as they're using. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist, one of the things that we think a lot about is motivational interviewing, which is we try to meet people where they're at. Um, I think that, that uh, if there's evidence for something 
and uh, there is community uh, support for it. Um, that's that's really important. That's really critical. But the other aspects that I mentioned, like I said, those turning points, like I said, having um, uh, greater access to things like Narcan, having greater access to fentanyl testing strips, uh, those also need to be concurrently supported and um, uh, encouraged. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another, um, when, when you talk about greater access to treatment, um, an idea that we have heard about is um, a mobile van. In other words, rather than having a brick and mortar hub, for lack of a better term, that there is a uh, van that goes around to, wondering what you um, think of something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what we need is innovation. Uh, we need innovation quickly in, in this space so that uh, we're able to prevent more needless deaths. Uh, as you know, um, there are some complex federal laws um, that are in place. And as long as we can have uh, sort of respect for those and have our sort of legal counsels vet uh, initiatives that we are in accordance with those, um, having uh, greater outreach, and that's what I was uh, saying, that having greater outreach, whether it is for testing, whether it is for uh, treatment, um, whether even if it is for a warm contact um, can be a very good thing. Uh, we live in a rural state um, and uh, we are seeing increases in fuel prices happening even in the most recent few weeks. Um, and these are all things that trickle downstream. We live in a state where people have a difficult time uh, leaving their jobs um, and be tied up at different places. So anything that can increase outreach um, can only build uh, good bridges for people that need it the most. Uh, I have another, um, we, uh, we heard a lot of suggestions or ideas this morning. And so I'm, I'm throwing them at you to hear what your views are um, in terms of them. And you talked about sort of safe spaces or sober places or recovery centers. And um, one of the suggestions that we heard this morning was to have a, for lack of a better term, a separate type of sober space for people coming out of the criminal justice, um, people coming out of jail. And um, on some level, that sounds very good. And on the other, the argument against it might be that um, you're 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 separating out a, a, a group of individuals that maybe we need to put with others and that maybe it would be in competition to the other recovery centers. I don't you know, but I'm curious from the point of view of um, you know, you as an addiction medicine um, expert or practitioner, think about having a sort of population specific recovery center. Yeah. I think that, you know, when uh, something is population specific, if it's value added, if it can encourage treatment, if it can encourage um, access, that's uh, something I definitely support. So for example, if it is somebody who has a history of trauma and uh, they are able to feel safer uh, in a, let's say women's only area, or um, LGBTQI uh, specific safe space. Uh, so anybody who's underrepresented or marginalized, there's virtue in that. However, this condition, it goes across economic lines, it goes across gender, it goes across ages. And, um, and there's a lot to be gained, a lot to be learned from having it be more of a open access uh, community uh, space where uh, everybody is on a road to recovery. Um, it's just that people come at it from different places. So it's a little bit of a both and um, okay. uh, answer, but if, it, if there's a biologic 
or clinical or medical rationale that can support recovery, that can support safety, support access, then it could be a good thing. But overall, it should be as open and as accessible as possible. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, I'm looking. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative McFawn, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, doctor, um, could you talk a little bit uh, about the use of um, fentanyl? in uh, somebody's treatment program. Do you feel that's appropriate? Or how do you feel it should be used? You know, that kind of thing. Just talk the, about- The actual use of fentanyl? Yes, fentanyl, yeah. Um, fentanyl is a really, really powerful anesthetic. Um, and uh, it is uh, really, if it is used, it's in a very highly monitored, um, operating room uh, or ICU type of setting under great uh, clinical vigilance and monitoring. Um, in terms of opioid use disorder, the FDA approved medications are more in the category of methadone or uh, buprenorphine or naltrexone. So um, are you saying that you probably don't think it's a good idea to use uh, fentanyl in, in anybody's treatment and in, in, in an addict's treatment program? Um, well, where it's, not, it's not FDA approved for that. So, you know, there's no way that, you know, I mean, the studies need to be done and, um, and really it is so powerful that it needs very, very strict monitoring. So really as, as prescribers. Fentanyl patches. Oh, you're just, you're talking about fentanyl patches. So again, it's not FDA approved for uh, treatment of um, any addiction. It is FDA approved for pain management. Right. Representative McFun, would you mind if I clarify your question? I think I, I understand where you're coming from based on earlier testimony, um, which was that in, in helping folks to uh, be on buprenorphine um, to allow an off-label use of fentanyl patches, as a way to titrate onto buprenorphine and not have a, an uh, exaggerated reaction or immediate withdrawal, which uh, uh, could actually push folks away from using that treatment in the long term. It might be a new idea coming in in a harm reduction model. Yeah, I think that as uh, prescribers, we are under great DEA scrutiny and vigilance for uh, any medications that we prescribe, but specifically uh, controlled, uh, controlled substances, controlled uh, medications. Um, uh, we really have to be very mindful that uh, things that are prescribed are um, you know, within a DEA uh, regulatory um, you know, requirements as well as uh, FDA approval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to do just one, I think just one more question. You never know. <laughs> um, Dr. Marudi, uh, what I'm understanding most from your testimony today is, is just how complex this issue is. And I think, uh, I think we all understand it and are, are hoping to, to take action um, in the next uh, week and a half or so um, through legislation. And so my question is, if there is one action that we could take as a legislative body right now to make a change in Vermont to impact and reduce overdose deaths, what action would you suggest that we take? An action that can be implemented in the next week and a half? <laughs> uh, I wish it could be implemented in the next week and a half. Um, but from a legislative perspective, we're putting the legislation together. Um, so it could be implemented in the next six months to a yeah. year, the, the next six months, as quickly as possible. Yeah. I have uh, so much respect and uh, gratitude um, for the way we do things in Vermont, um, which is it's very community oriented. Uh, we have a great tradition of helping each other, looking out for each other. 
the uh, designated agencies um, that are really at the front lines. And I have the privilege of interacting with them uh, once across the state actually, um, have uh, much of the infrastructure um, in place, but they also uh, require more support from us. And I think that if, uh, if we were to be able to engage them, um, they are really in the front lines. They're in the front lines of uh, um, everything from addiction, but also co-occurring mental health conditions. And they are very, very connected to the local communities um, as you all are uh, through your constituents. So I think that's, for me, uh, in terms of highest yield, that could be a really good starting point of uh, uh, really getting uh, a similar type of uh, assessment and needs assessment uh, of, okay, what is really needed? If you could have one thing, is it a mobile van? Is it um, the ability to staff your center so it's open 24 seven? Um, what is it? And it might be variable from uh, different counties across the state because their needs are variable and their cultures have some variability. So I think engaging the designated agencies, uh, doing a very uh, sort of uh, clear needs assessment that's not prolonged, that's very, very um, sort of rapid, and then having the ability to channel uh, some funds um, to support those needs could be uh, something that I would consider would be highest yield. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mariti. Um, I have one question. It sounded like one of the bigger sorts of uh, calls to action that you gave to us was to give organizations support for further outreach and that a lot of people living with substance use disorder may not be aware of the, uh, the resources that are already there. Um, and I think that if we were to you know, have um, ADAP in the room right now, they would uh, not to speak for them, but maybe point to Vermont Help Link. Right, mm -hmm. which is, I think, one of their main outreach tools connected to designated agencies. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the current state of Vermont Help Link as an outreach tool and how could it be built on and maybe more incorporated with some of the organizations that you've mentioned? Yeah, uh, it's a, Vermont Help Link is, uh, is great. It's a, it's a very uh, good effort. Um, I'm thinking in terms of uh, sort of a multi-channel strategy so that could be one way, it's, uh, it's present, it's there. Um, but another is, uh, you know, in medicine, we use the term warm handoffs. And, um, and you know, we've really seen the potency of recovery coaching. Um, so a lot of uh, peer led uh, type of initiatives. So augmenting um, Vermont Health Link with, um, you know, organizations like Turning Point, uh, creating some funding so if somebody uh, wants to become a recovery coach, they don't have barriers of um, finances related to that. Um, so then you can uh, sort of uh, address the outreach from multiple angles. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Representative McFawn, do, um, do you have a question? No, it's a legacy hand. Oh. Uh, um, I wanna before, um, another question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, Dr. Marudi, one of the things that we heard from one of our witnesses earlier today is that um, syringe exchange uh, sites as uh, syringe service providers as a harm reduction tool um, and believing that those have been uh, historically underfunded. Uh, do you have any uh, positions on uh, syringe exchange sites role within uh, our our work here. Yeah, I think as you rightly said uh, that it's uh, it's in the harm reduction category, and um, and uh, you know again it comes back to um, you know is the community uh, behind that initiative um, for uh, there is evidence that uh, syringe exchange sites um, uh, can be beneficial. However, one of the things, as I was saying, that if something is part of a continuum where um, we have other aspects that really do need uh, additional funding, then it's, a, it's something you can consider. 
um, but it just needs to be part of a, uh, a broader uh, strategy uh, that's very local and individual. Um, a lot of the activity that happens, a lot of the people that obtain access to uh, the drugs, uh, there are some local networks and, um, and especially in our state that has a low population but large surface area, um, really focusing on access to everything um, is really, I think, where we need to be pointing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are taking a lot of your time. I'm gonna take a look around the table. Um, Dr. Marudi, we, um, we don't have any more questions. I wanna just express our, our, our deep appreciation for you for making yourself available to us at such short notice and for providing us with such helpful testimony. Um, it's been, um, as, we, as we approach trying to do something quickly, I, what you might say is, you know, the, the, the immediate, then the, then the longer term or whatever, we're focusing right now on the more immediate. And so thank you for your suggestions and your thoughts and the way you um, talked about removing friction points it's not the same as removing safeguards. And I think, you know, some points that you made in terms of that. And um, I love the, uh, the metaphor of re um, recovery centers are an oasis in the middle of a desert. Um, and so some of that uh, is, um, and how we get access to treatment immediately uh, or more immediately. So um, Dr. Marudi, thank you very, very much. Um, really appreciate your um, assistance. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And uh, thank you to this committee for this opportunity to uh, testify in front of you. Um, you represent our communities. And um, I know that uh, these initiatives will bring a lot of hope. Uh, having your uh, strength and having your attention to this uh, problem uh, will contribute to us preventing um, preventable uh, deaths and, and injuries. So thank you also for the work that you do. And I, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, this ends our testimony and our uh, committee.